I mean, um, it's one thing that I've spent my career trying to, to unravel and, and, and reduce that notion. I mean, you know, it, it sort of starts from the 1990s when IBS was defined as a, as a condition based on criteria. So, and as a diagnosis, excuse me, of exclusion. So you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this, and this leftover stuff, if you meet these criteria, you have IBS. That's part of the dismissing the IBS because IBS is the waste basket, whatever's left. Uh, the second is that IBS was considered psychological. <clears throat> uh, and so therefore, you know, and more common in women. So, oh, women are anxious. Oh, it's a woman's disease. Oh, and, you know, those sorts of things. And then the, the worst is the name, irritable bowel syndrome. You're irritable, you have a bowel problem, and it's a syndrome, which means we don't know what's going on. It's not a disease. So all of what I've just said basically delegitimizes the patient. <clears throat> so that's why we've been working a lot to try to uncover the root causes of IBS, and we believe IBS is a disease, not a syndrome, and there's an organic basis for it. But um, my point is it, it's still stuck in in some clinicians, and, and they I, I heard in 2018 a physician give a lecture who's a senior researcher calling IBS a disease of hysterical women, which is shocking it, it would be shocking in the 1990s. It's more shocking considering all the research that's been done and to prove that that's not true, that um, you can't blame the person for the disease. But anyways, it's, I, I could go on and on because that's one of my big beefs about this condition. Well, I, I like to think that we've made progress, uh, and I think we have because... You may not know this, but I was responsible for bringing rifaximin to market. Um, and so that's sort of a claim to fame of our research group. <clears throat> and rifaximin legitimizes IBS uh, because IBS is a microbiome condition. Two weeks of an antibiotic and you're better. It it ain't a psychological condition if that happens, right? So, and, and why I'm saying that is that I would say the majority of gastroenterologists in the country recognize rifaximin as a true treatment for IBS. And as a result, you know, in some way, shape, or form, think there is an organic nature to a good subset of IBS. What hasn't happened is that that notion hasn't permeated to primary care uh, as um, the penetration in primary care is not as deep. So there are many primary care physicians who still treat IBS in the 1990 version of IBS and are stuck. So nothing is ever black and white, right? <clears throat> Even with rifaximin, it's not black and white. Uh, um, if you look at cardiovascular disease in the 19, early 1970s, if you had a heart attack, number one, you were in the hospital for a month because we didn't know what to do. We were scared to let you walk around in case you get another heart attack. Number two, you had to quit your CEO job because the stress of the job was killing you. Not the steaks, not the cigarettes, not the high blood pressure or the cholesterol, but the job. When we now know the job wasn't killing you, it was the steakhouses and the, and the alcohol and the other stuff. Um, <clears throat> but we learn over time. But we do know stress plays a role. Anxiety plays a role in diseases. So there's no, there's, there's no one without the other. So if I have IBS and I go to a restaurant and I'm terrified that I'm going to have an explosive diarrhea during my date with somebody I've only met this one first time, I have stress and anxiety. So... There's that kind of anxiety. And, and and then there's also the anxiety that we now understand could be related to the microbiome. The microbiome is producing uh, bioactive chemicals that can, can affect our mood, and there's a lot of research growing in that area. So the connection between IBS, anxiety, and depression and, and other psychological factors may be biologically based. <clears throat> there may be some connection with what we see in the microbiome. So but it's all part of the organic nature of this disease, that it isn't, you know, it isn't that you're stressed out or that you need to go do yoga and that'll help your IBS. Um, yoga helps everything, but it doesn't, it's not the treatment for irritable bowel syndrome. It's a treatment for your overall well-being. So I, I think that we have to sort of start to separate those two things, well-being 
and feeling um, balanced and stable in, in psychologically versus the organic parts of IBS. IBS, we, we were kind of set up. Um, so IBS was a disease of exclusion. And then you had to meet criteria. So IBS, by definition, was defined as pain with diarrhea or pain with constipation. So there's the two sides, the constipation and the diarrhea side. So how do drug companies respond? Well, okay, so if you had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, right, it's defined as inflammation. So all the drug companies developed anti-inflammatory drugs all the way up to the biologic agents you see commercials on TV. Get rid of the inflammation, get rid of the inflammation, get rid of the inflammation. Well, IBS is defined by pain or constipation, pain and constipation or pain and diarrhea. So the drug companies <clears throat> respond by developing stuff for diarrhea and developing stuff for constipation. But the whole notion of pharmaceutical development in IBS is based on getting rid of the symptom, not the cause. So for decades, we have drugs that make the diarrhea turn to constipation and the constipation turn to diarrhea to make people have relief because that was the basis for IBS. But the future is, is it a microbiome condition? Is it a histamine problem? Is it a mast cell problem? Is it, you know, and so now we're having other targets. And, and if the leaders in IBS can define IBS as those separate conditions, as those subconditions, we're going to have a better future because drug companies are going to develop things for those, not for just symptoms. Because I can make any diarrhea go away, go away with Imodium. It doesn't have to be IBS diarrhea. You know what I'm saying? So we have to get away from this symptom approach and move towards biological approaches. Okay. Funding, funding, funding. And, and, um, so if you think that IBS patients are dismissed because of this vague understanding of IBS, the NIH doesn't fund IBS because it's too vaguely understood. There aren't specifics, and we literally get almost a hundredth the amount of funding as other GI diseases. So IBS affects 30 to 60 million people. Crohn's affects 1 million people. Crohn's gets a quarter billion dollars in 10 years. IBS gets 10 million. That's a disconnect. Okay, so a disease that affects a huge swath of the population gets almost no money, and a disease that affects a small part of the population gets all the money because they have targets. So we have to be able to make that jump to biological, biological plausible causes so that we can get funding. Uh, and then funding will drive the better things for these patients. And then in terms of primary care, you know, go to some education sessions. Um, go to some education sessions. And number three is go to some education. Because there's information, a lot of information out there on the modern um, understanding of IBS. And it, it's not just in your head. <clears throat> and it's hard for primary care. I, I, I'm being a little flippant, but, but you know, I have a tough time keeping up in my field. I can't imagine primary care that's trying to embrace cardiology, respirology, or you know, pulmonary and all these different uh, disease states and try to keep up to the most modern level in all of them. It's impossible. So I get it. But, but there is education out there. And, and IBS is not a rare condition. You, know, you should be versed in it.